Welcome to the Strategy Skills Podcast, our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, you can get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It's a free download and you can get it at firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. And also, if you want to get McKinsey and BCG winning resume, which is a resume that got offers from both of those firms, you can get it at firmsconsulting.com forward slash resume PDF. And today we have with us Deborah Ancona. Deborah is a distinguished professor of management and founder of the MIT Leadership Center. And Deborah specializes in studying, teaching, consulting in the areas of individual leadership, team effectiveness, and organizational transformation. And her new work centers on how family ghosts end up in the executive suite. So very, very interesting topics to study. Welcome, Deborah. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Could you tell us about your journey that led you to doing the work you are doing now? Sure. It's it's been a bit of a of a long journey. Uh, I started uh, life as a psychologist. I was always interested in psychology. Always interested in how people act and what kinds of uh, what happens to people in teams. So that was always an interest all the way back to university. Uh, and then uh, I followed up by uh, getting a PhD, where I took that. Uh, interest in teams and spent a lot of time looking at teams. And why was it that the things that we knew about teams, the things that everybody was writing about, uh, didn't actually work when we tried to predict actual performance by teams? So my, I started out my work and my my dissertation was the things we think work don't work. And so that was a real motivator for me. And I spent a number of years trying to really figure out what does make teams effective and innovative. And uh, after that, went more macro and started thinking about, well, how do we need to structure organizations so that these teams that we need to create have a hospitable environment? Uh, And more recently, Uh, I've had a good time going back to my psychology uh, background and looked at what are the individual skills uh, that make people effective. And so we started the MIT Leadership Center, and that was really fun to begin to develop this this model of individual leadership. And much more recently, my work on, as you mentioned, family ghosts. So it's kind of been moving uh, around from teams to organizations to individuals. And I just do something for a while. And then I say, oh, there's another question we have to ask. And I like to, to follow the data and follow the trends. Do you remember a moment when you decided to be a professor? You know, it's interesting not really. Um, I I got a degree in psychology, and what happened was I I couldn't really get a job that that paid enough at that point to support a lifestyle. And also, I had been doing a lot of counseling um, with people who were very very damaged and in need of a lot of help, and and it just felt like I was getting pulled down with that. So I happened accidentally to take a course on organizational behavior. And I thought, ooh, this is a much more interesting way to use psychology in a different kind of setting. And that was very appealing. And so I decided, well, I need to learn more. So I'm going to get a PhD. I'm not sure I realized exactly that that was going to lead me to be a professor. And that was what I had to do. It was a little bit kind of driving blind as to to what the end result was going to be. Most of our listeners are senior leaders in large organizations, and they have no idea what it is like to be a professor at MIT. Could you describe to us what is it like? Um, Sure. Uh, Being a professor at MIT. Well, when you start as a professor, it is a heavy duty grind. It is very stressful because uh, universities like consulting firms and other kinds of, of partnership companies um, is an up or out system. So you go for seven or eight years trying to publish enough to get tenure because tenure is your seal of approval. It's like making partner 
uh, at a company. Uh, so you are extremely stressed and working day and night to publish enough material so that you are in top level journals so that other academics around the world say that your work is important and adds something to existing theory. So it's this very inward workaholic set of years when you're also having to teach and having to make sure that the students like you. Um, many, many moons ago, if you did a lot of research, it didn't matter how you taught. That is not true at business schools anymore. Uh, now you actually have to do quite well in the classroom in, in order to move ahead. So um, it's that slog for seven or eight years until you do get tenure. And then um, it's kind of a freeing process whereby you then can move to study the things you want to study. You move to be more externally oriented in terms of getting the word out and doing not just the academic kind of publishing, but also managerial kind of publishing. Um, but it's still, MIT is a very competitive environment. Uh, it's an, an environment where you're expected to really know your field, to be able to contribute to that field over time. Uh, and so people are always studying, reading, asking questions, interviewing people, uh, working with companies, because we do a lot of external intervention uh, in executive education and with the executives that we teach. This is all in the business school. It's, it's very different if you're an MIT professor in engineering or in science. But at, um, at a business school, it's kind of that work really, really hard, get tenure, and then move in some other directions. That was such an incredible way to describe it. Thank you so much. And I loved how you compared Venya to being a partner at a consulting firm. It makes it very easy to understand. If you could come back to the time you just started at MIT, what advice would you give to yourself? I think that if I were coming back to myself starting MIT, the first thing I would say was, don't be so nervous. Don't be so stressed because it, it just is a very stressful period. And I do also say that to my to the junior colleagues who are who are just coming in uh, because they just feel that pressure, that up or out pressure. But in fact, if you do the work and you do it well, then usually things pan out. And if they don't, uh, there are a lot of other places where you can go and have a great career. Uh, so the best thing is not to be stressed. And that's easier said than done uh, because the pressure, the pressure is there. But uh, but I, I think other than that, I did what I wanted to do. I studied the things that I found really, really interesting. Uh, and I was, uh, in some sense, lucky that what I was interested in melded with with what journals were were happy to publish. When it comes to the classroom, what do you think are the key things someone needs to know, to master, to be an exceptional professor at the business school? Oh, that's a great question. And I have to say, I was not a great, a great professor when I started. Um, the the comments at the beginning of teaching, I, I taught with two other faculty. We each taught for three weeks of the semester. And um and the first person who taught, he he was on a lot of boards. And the person who came after me was very cool. He drove his motorcycle. And there I was in the middle, kind of teaching my theory. And the comments at the end of the semester were, if you could just get rid of that middle part, it would be much better. So it was starting from a very low level. But uh, over time, I think, again, some of it comes with confidence, not worrying about what everybody is thinking about you or whether or not they're going to like you or whether or not they're going to be excited by what you're teaching. But the confidence to know that uh, what you have to say is important and useful. I also think that over time, you come to understand a lot more about what gets students interested and excited, asking them questions so that they have to think through and apply the theories that exist to real life phenomena and um, 
asking people to really reflect on their own leadership when you're trying to help them to move in a new direction. Unless you understand where you are as a leader or where your team is currently, it's very hard to think about how it could be different and and where you might want to go. So uh, my my teaching has shifted quite a bit over time to give people that that time to reflect, to kind of say less and apply more. This is very helpful. And now when you're in front of a classroom, do you still feel a little bit nervous or it's completely gone? I have to say that every single person I know is a little bit nervous before going into class, particularly for the first day, for the first time. Um, But now I'm much there's very little, very little nervousness and stress, even even for big groups, even for, because I've done it many, many times. And uh, I feel like that enables me actually to be more receptive to the audience. Now I'm not focused on myself at all. I'm focused on who are these people and are they getting what I what I want them to to get? Do they understand it? I'm much more likely to jump in and say, no, that's not what it is that can we let's let's pull back. How can we really use this? How can we think about it differently? Uh, this is how you're applying it. Might we think of it from another angle or a different way? So um by by not focusing on myself and focusing on them, I feel like I'm a I'm a much much uh, better teacher, and it's more fun. It's more interesting. This is such an important thing to do. I share it with my clients all the time. When you're giving a presentation, when you're working with clients, put your focus on the client, on the people you are speaking to. It's much more effective. What surprised you about your students? Maybe something that you did not expect it at all. That's an interesting question. Uh, I have, first of all, the most amazing students. They are really smart. They are, uh, I I teach mostly executives right now. I I teach in the executive MBA program and our Sloan Fellows program and also exec ed. So uh, I I don't really do much with with the younger students. Um, Their perspectives are really, really interesting. Uh, I guess what surprises me is When you look out at a set of MIT students who are well-groomed, articulate, poised, bringing in interesting information, really have the the readings down and and know how to think clearly, um, you you get an impression that these people have had a kind of an easy life or have have gone up the hierarchy um, without a whole lot of pain. And that's incorrect. Um, I get to hear a lot from my students because I have them uh, go into uh, their past, uh, some of the challenges they face, some of their family backgrounds. And these folks are incredible in the challenges that they have met and dealt with from abuse, poverty, violence. Uh, We have a very uh, international student base coming from all over and and people from many different backgrounds. And it hasn't been easy. These folks have really worked and, and gone through fire sometimes to come and be a student at MIT. I know exactly what you mean. And uh, people who went through a lot and remained hardworking and dedicated and not abusive to other people, it's such an incredible thing to see. And they, they make very, very strong leaders. I would think that you have some of that in in your clients as well, that it, there's more than meets the eye when you're when you're working with the people that you work with. Definitely, 100%. And I myself had very challenging journey up to here. And I worked with a lot of clients who had very challenging journeys and they first in their family in many, many ways, not just in one way, not just the first person to go to school, not just the first person to go to grade school, not just the first person to make, for example, partner at a large management consulting firm, but so many things and they pull everyone up with them. And it is an incredible thing to see and very inspiring leaders. I think that as I mentioned, when you go through so much and you remain kind towards people, not abusive, and you have good intentions, but you went through so much, you have so much more empathy because you've been through so much and you can connect with anyone, with everyone. And I think it makes you a very, very good leader. Yes, I agree. Although, uh, as, as I say in, in some of the work on on family ghosts, there are also um, things that 
that these people bring with them, which gives them empathy, but also uh, can be difficult to manage all the way through. And this is such an interesting topic, and I'm so glad that you are looking into it, because so much of our success is really who we are inside and the lens through which we look and uh, how do we not let all the bad things that people told us when we were a child and all the bad things that were done to us when we were children and adults later on. But often trauma from childhood is very hard to recover from. How do we not let it negatively impact us? So let's talk about it. It's such a good transition to your work on costs. How can someone identify what kind of traumas from the past negatively impacting them as a leader? A lot of people have had hard times. A lot of people have had many, many challenges. I would differentiate that. Sometimes if if you're too traumatized from something that happened, then it's very difficult to to make progress. So I, I would say that. Um, most of the people that I work with are not that deeply traumatized. Um, they, they've had a difficult time, but I wouldn't say that that it's been awful uh, because some, for a few people, yes, but but not most of the people. So let's go to family ghosts. Family ghosts are those attitudes and behaviors and beliefs that we take from childhood and bring with us into the executive suite. So there's a process by which um, when a particular thing happens at work, it triggers us almost to have the same reactions that we had when we were kids. And um, how do you figure that out? Um, what what are your triggers? What are your ghosts? Uh, Dennis Perkins and I wrote an article called Family Ghosts in the Executive Suite, and we don't have time to go into all the details, but um, in there is, is a framework where you can look at different aspects of your family, things like what were the values, what were the beliefs, what roles did you play, what um, secrets did they have? Uh, you, you go through this and, and sort of from that analysis, come up with, well, what are the primary ghosts that are playing out now? And they, some of them are good. Not everything about your family is bad. I mean, we we bring from that family system some great things. Um, if you had a hard time, it may be that you learned perseverance and you learned how to work hard and you learned how to you know please people. So th- those things can help you in your career. And so it's important to identify those things that are positive. But sometimes even the positives can also be negative. So working hard, if you feel like you can never stop, you have to be a perfectionist, you're working 24 seven, then that can turn into burnout. And if you are always trying to please somebody, uh, then some folks have a hard time even knowing what they want because they're so busy pleasing their bosses and pleasing their peers and trying to please everyone that it, it they just stop and they don't know, okay, well, what do I want to do? What is my vision for this? Not how do I help somebody else with their vision? Um, or for some people who had difficult childhoods, um, they become very independent, independent very early on. And being independent helps you to be a leader, helps you to be a great manager. You uh, know how to make decisions. You know how to take care of yourself and your team. That's great. Um, But the other side of that is um, some people then can't delegate and some people can't ask for help because they feel like everything has to be done by themselves. So so it's looking at what are the positives and what are the negatives. And then uh, we go through a whole process of, of change, including things like, um, well, this ghost is taking on too much of a role that that um, please everybody ghost is getting in the way because I want to be promoted to being a general manager. And that means having my own voice. So then what I want to do is think about how do I take that ghost and put it kind of off stage as Gestaltians think about it off stage and which ones do I want to bring center stage? Maybe I want to bring that independent thinker center stage or that entrepreneurial self. Cause um, you know, I, I have the, 
fun of interviewing lots of executives and um, uh, Eileen Fisher the of the clothing uh, manufacturer used to talk about her uh, or talked about at her family table at night, everybody talked and everybody contributed and everybody had something to say. And she brought that into her company, into the culture of her company. Uh, so you want to think about, again, what are you bringing for yourself? What is it and, and what is the impact on others? And how do you bring the best parts forward? And, and how do you get over those negatives? And again, there are a number of different ways that you can do that. And one of the ways I heard you talking about is role models, finding someone who has a similar issue and how they're able to overcome it as a leader. Could you speak about how do you find someone who is a role model related to a particular goal? Because it seems very challenging. Well, um, I'm not sure how challenging it is. It, it, I think it was more challenging um, before we had so many TED Talks and videos and leaders who are on these podcasts and talking about all kinds of things and what they do and, and being revealing about how they approach different, different things. So uh, in my classes, as students sort of pick something that they want to improve and recognize what it is that gets them in trouble or what things trigger them, away from being able to do what they want to do, uh, then um, then it's not that difficult to find who is it that's like you, because you don't want someone who's very different from you, who's somewhat like you, who embodies those, those activities or those behaviors that you want to try for, um, but doesn't seem to be as, it doesn't seem to be as problematic for that person. Um, so, I mean, for a number of people, uh, they need to delegate more. Very often, we, we, I do a lot of work on X teams and distributed leadership. And part of what we help executives do is say, okay, you've got to, you are still the leader, but you've got to give autonomy and certain leadership to other people further down in the company. That's what we call distributed leadership. And often executives say, oh, that's a great idea. But as soon as they start doing it, they stop or they, they they interrupt people, they take over again, they start making decisions. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to lose control or they're afraid it's going to be chaotic or uh, they're afraid that um, uh, that no one's going to think they're important anymore, that their power is gone. Um, so there are a lot of great executives who are able to delegate. So I say, okay, find out what do they do? And, and it's not just finding a role model. It's being like a detective, a detective that says, what does that person do? How does that person delegate? What is his or her tone of voice? Uh, what do they say, actually? What is their demeanor? Um, how do they not have chaos erupting? What is it they actually do to maintain control even as they let other people make decisions? How does that happen? And you have to be a detective to really, really, really capture the things that someone does that you're trying to learn. Because unless you get into those micro things, it's hard for you to take that on then and do the same thing. Yes, I think the challenge for me was you can find people with a similar issue, but then to find how they deal with this issue in the workplace is more challenging. So someone can be on TikTok, but it doesn't mean that they have a book describing in detail how specifically they deal with this particular issue. So I think, yes, we live in the best possible time to find those role models, but it still requires some detective work. Yeah, and you don't always need proximity, to be fair. You don't actually have to know the person. Uh, for example, a lot of the female leaders in my classes um, want to know kind of how do I not get ruffled? Some of the men, too. <laughs> how do I not get ruffled if someone comes at me and attacks me and, and says I'm I'm my idea is not a good one uh, or uh, something to that effect? And I've started showing a video, for example, of Christine Lagarde um, as a role model because a lot of my female students used her as a role model. And so I show a little video clip where she's being interviewed and 
in that interview, uh, the interviewer just sort of attacks her and says, people have said you elbow your way in. And she's just amazing. And then we we really examine in class, okay, what does she do when she gets attacked like that? And we say, okay, she sits, she does not, she does not go, oh my goodness, she does not get all riled up. She's very calm. She gives herself a moment to think about it. She's dressed very nicely and professionally, so she doesn't come off as as not caring or it gives her a sense of authority. Um, she comes back with a saying in um, uh, in Latin as a way to sort of show that she has authority. And then she does this thing that's very powerful. We do this a lot in our leadership classes, a reframe. We do. This, she does a reframe. And she says right back to the interviewer, no, I don't elbow my way in. I stand my ground. She takes what was said and makes it less cutting and less offensive, and then proceeds to tell a story of how she stands her ground. And so right there, the students say, oh, this is good. I have to, I have to be calm. Um, I have to reframe. They're coming at me with an accusation. How do I say it's not that, it's something else? And then what story shows this new other, this other perspective that I want to leave with the audience? Uh, and so it's a kind of a one, two, three, and you have to practice that. But there are um, there are videos of people talking about encounters that they have with other executives or um, in other kinds of stressful situations where they go through and talk about what they did. There are also lots and lots of biographies. Um, uh, one of them is um, American Icon, uh, which is a story of Alan Mulally and how he took over at Ford, for example. It's a little bit old, but um, there it's very detailed. How did he enter? What did he say? How did he do sense making? How did he deal with the Ford family? How did he look at the financials and deal with them? How did he talk to people? It, it's very detailed in some of those books. So, so you can you can pick a leader that not just oh I want to be like this leader, but this is a leader that um, showcases something that I want to learn and read about how they do it. Deborah, could you share more resources, books that people can refer to to learn how to deal with particularly challenging ghost issues? If anything else comes, um, yeah. Well, so I would I would start as I said with um, with the article. Um, there are a lot of people who talk about the ghosts that we carry with us. Um, a lot of them are um, family theorists, or that's how a, a lot of the work that that we look. So Virginia Satir is one of them. Mnuchin is another one. Uh, David Cantor. So all of these people write quite extensively on family systems. It may be more than some executives want to look at. Um, in terms of reframing, one could look at um, a lot of re references of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, David Burns is someone who's written a lot in that area. Those are those reframes that that help you to get over issues that you might have. So that would be a start. And in terms of role models, anyone comes to mind or any other books come to mind? Well, I think it's harder for role models because people have different things that they want that they want to be better at. Um, so um, I, I think what you have to do is say who who in my company is better at this than I do. Can I learn from them? Who um, we often have students in the class. I like to to pair them up. Okay, well, you wish you were a little bit more directive and you're a little too directive. So you guys get together and talk about how you can help each other in terms of, of what you're doing. So you should look around you and your company for some role models and then think about just pay attention as you're listening. I mean, there are politicians everywhere right now who are talking. Do any of them exemplify something that you want to see? Or is there a new uh, book out from a business leader that I would like to learn more about. Uh, right now, Satya Nadella is a big 
uh, icon in terms of distributed leadership and organizational transformation. And uh, there quite there's quite a lot of video material on him. Um, if people, so, so I, I also teach a lot of entrepreneurs and um, I show uh, the founder of Rent the Runway, uh, General Jennifer Hellman, Hellman or Hyman, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure, um, who is interviewed, for example, at Stanford, and you can watch her interview and she'll tell you, well, I had this idea for a business and um, the next day I was emailing Diane von Furstenberg. And two days later, I had an, an interview with her. Um, well, how did she do that? And she continues to tell story after story about how she got her company off the ground and really moved it and moved it very quickly. I mean, a big thing now is we're in an exponentially changing world, speed, everything is going faster and faster and faster. And so we need to learn to speed up our decision making to uh, speed up our the way our teams operate to do more partnering with uh, other organizations. And so, okay, that's something that she's done. So let's watch. Um, so just pay attention to what is it you're trying to work on? And are there any indicators that there's another executive or two or three or four, you want multiple role models who you can borrow things from? What are some of the common costs you see with your students? I think I've, I've mentioned some of them, the the, the perfectionist workaholic um, for whom it's never enough, never gets done, um, go, 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 go. Um, sometimes with that is I'm not good enough. Um, so people are, um, per what you were saying earlier, a lot of people got a lot of negative uh parenting. And uh, so they're always trying to prove that they're great and that they're better. Again, there are different ways in which ghosts show themselves. Um, but that's definitely, for again, for my students who are very high performing, successful people, that's a dominant ghost. The, the pleaser ghost is another one, pleasing everybody. I want to please everybody and, and get that done. Um, for some, uh, there's the play it safe ghost. Um, so for people from families that, for example, um, tried something and failed. So it, it may have been that there was um, a loss of fortune, that, that there was some uh, real setback in the business world or for people who just stayed the course and, and never innovated at all and were very successful, either one, either you, you tried something and it didn't work or in your family or, and your, or your family did always the same thing, then you often come up with a play it safe strategy. And the play it safe strategy, uh, again, in the context of this world where things are moving so quickly, you may have to her COVID, uh, COVID playing it safe, you've got to innovate at that moment in time. You've got to maybe switch your business model or switch the way that you're operating. And so for those people, that kind of change is very, very difficult. Um, and so dealing with those things, it may work in some environments at some times and at other times in other environments that that doesn't work. Um, another ghost that we find is uh, for folks who are conflict averse. And sometimes being conflict diverse, again, works for you because you don't get into fights, you don't get into conflicts. And so um, it's easier to, to move ahead and, and get things done. But um, the other side of that is you sometimes avoid difficult conversations. Uh, I had one person who was so conflict diverse that he couldn't give any negative feedback to his um, direct reports. And then things got worse and worse and worse and there was no record. So that was, that's obviously problematic. Um, so uh, those, that, that ghost is, is there. Um, so those are some examples. For someone who is struggling with, I'm not good enough ghost, which is something I often see with clients and very successful people. And then they work very hard to prove that they are good enough. It's actually very, very common with you 
faculty background and all this experience and expertise that you have? What advice would you give them? So, so that's a very hard one because there are a lot of people who think that they aren't good enough. And so part of that, um, part of that work is is understanding why you think you're not good enough. Because sometimes just identifying where the ghost came from can can help you with it. Because instead of just feeling something, you um, are able to put it out there. You're able to identify it. And, and that's step one very often is, okay, this is what's going on. And these are the situations in which that gets gets triggered, that that comes out more and more often. Um, and then, well, we have a bunch of coaches who who help with the work that we do, particularly we have a, a 360 instrument to uh, get um, ratings or scores on your leadership capabilities. And the coaches there uh, with people who are, feel sometimes they're not good enough, they start with all the positives. Okay. As soon as you got your 360 feedback report back, you immediately looked at what you're not good at. You immediately looked at, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. That's really bad. So again, let's reframe. The reframing is a very positive, uh, a very powerful thing. So let's start right up on the whiteboard, all the positive things. What are your highest scores? What is it that people said that was good about you? Uh, and sometimes it means capturing that and writing it down so that you can remind yourself, oh, well, these are some things. For some people, I, I don't want to um, seem as if take this lightly. Um, and, and there are certain issues that are not going to get solved by using this model in, in the workplace. There are some people for whom if that's really deep and problematic, you might have to go and see a therapist. So um, th that's not the work that I do. Um, but if it's if it's really deep and um, you need to learn more, then it, it may not be, this model doesn't solve all problems that people have in terms of their, um, their psychological issues. But starting out with, okay, here are all the things that are positive about what you do. You might even uh, ask people, there's an, uh, an instrument that comes from the University of Michigan. Uh, they have a positive psychology center actually. And there there's an assignment where you are asked to capture what is a time in your life that you were really, really proud of who you are, of who you were and what you did and capture that. And actually start interviewing people to say, um, what, what is a time when I really showed up at my best and what does that look like? So that people can get more centered in on, okay, these are the moments where I feel my strongest. How do I get more of those? How do, how do I move to try to have more of those experiences where I feel really good about myself as opposed to always focusing on the negative? And maybe even noticing it every day, writing it down. What have I done today that I'm really proud of? And then you just exactly. think you're developing this new way of looking at yourself. And what do I have? I mean, a lot of the positive psychology people and the happiness people uh, talk about being thankful. So rather than what, what do I not have? What is it that I'm thankful for? What is it? Again, that's a, that's a reframe into a more positive uh, kind of, of um way of thinking you speak about exponentially changing world for mm -hmm. leaders who have to deal with it and we all have to deal with it every single one of us what is your recommendation in terms of how to identify things to pay attention to because so much is changing all the time uh yeah well that's a hard one um but um it's interesting that um when we ask executives what are the traits of high-performing leaders? More and more, and in, in the olden days, no one mentioned it at all, but more and more, there's a focus on sense-making. This idea of you have to make sense of the context in which you are operating. Uh, and that requires you to set some priorities. Okay, what is it that we most need to understand? Maybe right now it's AI because everybody's moving ahead with AI and I need to understand um, more about where might we use it 
in, in the company or with my, my group? Uh, what are the best places? Is it better to use in sales? Is it better to use in consulting? Is it better to use what, whatever? So um, you have to do sense making to say, all right, well, what's going on out there that I need to understand in order to kind of deal with this exponentially changing world. And so sense making is a, is a core capability in our individual leadership model, but also in our X team teams model, uh, figuring out how do you do sense making. Um, and so that involves a number of things. It means, first of all, when you're going out, you have to have a learning mindset, uh, which means being open minded. If you go out to learn about something, you can't believe that you know it all already or that you have all the answers. Um, and it's it's pretty interesting. We we do this exercise in, in my class where we say, okay, you have to be open-minded and, and pay attention to what you don't know. And then they say, okay, prepare an interview. And they write down, you have to ask about this and this and this and this and this. And then we come back and say, oh, wait a second. That assumes that you know all the right questions to ask. And if you don't know a lot, you may not know the right answers, the questions to ask. So you should ask things like, what haven't I asked you about? What keeps you up at night? What are the most interesting findings? If you're looking at AI, for example, what are the most interesting findings in AI that you've come up with? What is it that we should know as we're looking at these problems uh, as to how AI might, de might be deployed? So a lot of open-ended questions around things you don't know. So first thing is open-minded. Second thing is start learning from others, uh, what psychologists call vicarious learning. This is all part of sense-making. Um, so vicarious learning is learning from others. Okay, we want to do, I'm just using AI because it's everybody's talking about it now and everybody's worried about it now. So it's one area of uncertainty and, and rapid change. Uh, so vicarious learning is who in your industry is way ahead of you on using it? What have they learned? How has it worked? What, what's worked? What hasn't worked? Even people in other industries, go talk to industry gurus. There are a lot of people working in this area. Who do you trust? Who is a good source of information? Uh, what kind of... Um, so, so it's that vicarious learning is learning from others who know more than you do so that you up your your knowledge base uh, about both what is AI, what can it do, how has it been used, uh, what's been the most successful, what are some of the things that haven't worked. Um, one of the, the findings in this big study of using AI, for example, at, at BCG, the consulting group, uh, was that even though using AI in consulting improved quality and productivity, particularly for low and mid-level performers, those things went way up. Uh, people felt like a little bit like they lost their voice, that they got addicted to using AI. And so they weren't keeping their own skills going and they weren't pushing back. We push back on a human in a way that we don't push back on technology, but technology makes mistakes too. So we have to learn more about calibrating how we use these things. That was just an example of learning about current uh, current studies and current work. Uh, another thing that, that you have to do is after you've, as you point out, you don't wanna just keep getting information because at a certain point you get overwhelmed. So the idea is collect some information and then pull it together. What have we learned? What are the trends? What are the patterns? What's most useful for us? What is it that we can work on right now? Okay, now let's work, let's try an experiment to see if that's true. So it's it's taking the information, pulling it together, creating a map. Uh, the father of sense making is a professor called Carl Wyke, and he calls about sense making as map making. So you want to map the territory so that you can experiment and see if you've gotten it right. Uh, and those last two pieces, we think sometimes that what we have to do is just collect more and more and more information, but more and more information just gets you more confused. So it's better to have focused sense making and then sort of sensing and then make sense of it, sense make, and then try it out to see if it's right and then start over. So 
in X teams where we do a lot of sense making, we we push people in X teams to do sense making, and X teams are externally oriented teams. Uh, so when I spoke earlier about the things that we thought we knew about teams were wrong, um, one of the things we get wrong is that we think high performing teams are all about internal process. If we create psychological safety and trust and good communication and lack of conflict and clear goals and roles, then we have a great team. But in fact, that's only half the story. And the other half is that you have to be externally oriented in an exponentially changing world. You have to do that sense making. You have to do that aligning up and down the firm. You have to coordinate with other parts of the ecosystem and the organization in order to be productive. Uh, and so as a team, you might say, okay, you leader of the team, next week, we're all gonna interview a customer and come back and say, what did we learn? And what else does the market research say? And what is it that is the feedback that we're getting? And then pull that together and say, okay, what does that mean for how we, how we will improve the way we deal with customers? Or it could be, again, AI. Let's do some AI sense making. Um, and so do that, it, do it in that way. Deborah, thank you so much. What would be some final words you want to share? And also where can our listeners learn more about you, buy your book, anything you want to share? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> Went in a lot of personal directions. I wasn't, I wasn't anticipating, but it was an interesting. It was interesting. Made me think uh, during the interview. Uh, so, if you want to learn more about me, uh, you can look at uh, um, uh, MIT Sloan website, uh, Deborah Ancona, and I am there. Also, if you're looking at the courses, uh, it's MIT Sloan Executive Education uh, and Emeritus have courses. Uh, the book, X Teams, How to Create Teams that Lead, Innovate, and Succeed, you can get on Amazon or other, other platforms. Um, I also uh, have a little company uh, with some other folks, and it's called X Lead. And X Lead, you can find readings as well as products to help with your leadership development or team effectiveness or organizational transformation. Deborah, thank you again so much for being part of this. And uh, thank you so much for all the work you are doing. Thank you for being so open during today's interview. You shared so much wisdom and expertise. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, well, again, thank you very much for, for inviting me and having me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Such a great discussion. Very important topics we covered. Our guest today again has been Deborah Ancona. Check out her book. It's called X Teams, How to Build Teams that Lead, Innovate, and Succeed. And our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, you can get the overall approach using well-managed strategy studies. It's a free download and you can get it at firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. And you can also get McKinsey and BCG winning resume. It's a resume that got offers from both firms. So you can compare your resume to this resume and see what you can improve. And you can get it at firmsconsulting.com forward slash resume PDF. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And I look forward to connect with you all next time.